I think the same thing would be true of people that have really high blood pressure. They lose weight and then their medication needs to be adjusted. Right. Which is great. And that's the way I approach a lot of my patients mm. that want to get off their blood pressure medication. We work on addressing the underlying factors that wow. are causing their blood pressure to be elevated. The most common things are stress, inactivity, and being overweight. Yes, it's hard on the body. It's hard right. on the heart and the circulatory system. Yeah. Right. So if you take care of those factors, and there are other factors inside the body we can work with, different nutrients that might be deficient that will help. And I don't have to talk about changing their dosage because their medical doctor is going to have to deal with that. Yes. The dosage, you know, their, their blood pressure goes down and you get to a point where you can't maintain that same dosage. You have to reduce it Correct. because you're getting dizzy and you're really fatigued. Yes. And you can show your doctor, look, I've lost 25 pounds. I'm eating healthier. I'm exercising. We, we need to reduce this. Yes. That is where I think really good communication comes into play and where and how and why you are really good fit for a traditional, not not separate from, but with a traditional right. a traditional system. Like someone has a doctor, is on medication. Yes, they can hire a naturopathic doctor as well. Right. And everyone should be thrilled about that. Yeah. Because it's we all get what we want, which is a regular doctor wants someone to be healthier. The person wants to be healthier. Of course, that's what you want. Right. So it is something that I want people to get in their heads that it's not an either or. You're listening to Take On Healthcare with Ted Suzelis and Mary Sheehan. Ted is a naturopathic doctor who has been helping people in Northeast Ohio for over 20 years to live a happier and healthier life through natural healthcare, including dietary advice, vitamins, herbs, and other natural substances. Mary is a full-time pharmacist who also helps leaders in healthcare suffering with anxiety and depression integrate the best parts of traditional and alternative medicine. If you're sick of the hype around what it takes to be well, listen to today's Take on Healthcare podcast. Dr. Ted and Mary dispense the simple truth about what it takes to live longer and healthier. Because it's January, this is the time of year we, we, where we are all inundated with messages from the socials, from everywhere about how we can live longer and healthier. This is when America focuses on health and wellness. Definitely, we sh yeah. should be focusing all the time, but this is when we focus on it. And everybody promises the secret. Right. And the secret is there is no secret. But we still have six ways for you to take control of your health and maximize your outcomes. So please stay till the end where we have saved our best suggestion for last. Suggestion number one is living a healthy lifestyle. It's a really a cornerstone. It definitely is. And I think that this is probably one of the most important tips we're going to talk about. We're not going to talk about it in huge, great detail because it's no secret. It's living a healthy lifestyle. The main factors, everybody knows, but we have trouble implementing different pieces. So you have some, some people that will be really good at one part and other pieces, they're going to fall to the wayside. And we'll talk about how that works together. But yeah, it's such a good point. And, and because that's the cornerstone of being a naturopathic doctor is to get those pieces and parts for that baseline healthy lifestyle. Right. I never thought of it that way. Like that could be why people fail. It's not lack of understanding or lack of messaging. We all get what the basics are. But if you struggle with one part, you may be tempted to just abandon the whole thing of getting well. Right. Or focus on the things that you're really good at implementing okay. and forget the others. Which would be human nature. Right. But you're never going to get there then. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, um, like I said, these are all things we know. And we're going to talk about seven different factors of living a healthy lifestyle for people. And number one for me as a naturopathic doctor is definitely healthy eating. Okay. We can't, if, like your mom always said, you are what you eat. If you don't put good food in, then you have no hope of being fully healthy. True. True. 
Other factors go along with regular exercise, Mm -hmm. getting enough sleep, and managing your stress. And so for those first four, like I said, some people, you have a lot of people that are, say, gym people. And they'll be pretty healthy because they're exercising all the time. Yes. But they have a lot of trouble with the diet part because, well, they're younger, they're in good health, eating eating crap potentially, mm-hmm. but they can maintain that because they're young and healthy and the exercise will pull them through. So true. And in the gym, they might look a certain way and so... And feel a certain way. They don't right. feel the manifestations of eating something that's not agreeing with them. And I think what I too, what I also like about your broad perspective with food, it's not just because food is going to make you um, feel less energized or gain weight, but could be the underlying issue in a lot of the other health problems that people have. Right. That we don't link to food when you no. said you are what you eat. Exactly. Love that. That's a really good point. And then, so those are four things that foundationally to live a healthy lifestyle that you do. And then exactly. there's three things. Well, there's two things you don't do, or, you know, then what are those last three that aren't in that, that category? Right. So the last three are going to be maintaining a healthy weight, uh, not smoking, and limiting your alcohol. Right. Those are things... Not smoking, that's a that's a no. And limiting alcohol, do you agree that do you ever see that where it's gonna the recommendation is gonna be no alcohol? Or you don't think that's possible in the culture? Uh, it depends on what we're talking about. I mean, as far as health wise, I would say yes. Probably mm-hmm. we shouldn't be drinking alcohol, period. Right. But just like everything in our lives, we have to have balance. And if we swing too far to the let's totally 100% restrict everything that might be bad for us, eventually you're going to break. You're right. That's a really good point. You're absolutely right. And with the alcohol, I mean, some of the things that really show the best research with actually benefiting you have to do with like red wine. And in men, right? Yeah. But it's just that red wine and, you know, we have... Yes, we have this is my problem. Like resper- you know, mm-hmm. um, resveratrol. Resveratrol. Is that it? Yes, that has a lot of antioxidant properties and a lot of different good properties. But you can get that in a supplement. You can get that by eating grapes. You can do other, get other sources. You don't have to get it from the alcohol. Right, and and what I think the messaging then gets diluted. So we right. do one small study with red wine in men of a certain age. And then suddenly, when the message trickles down to the average person, it's moderate drinking is not bad for you. In fact, it can be good for your heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, things get diluted. That's the part that bothers me when we, um, when the messaging gets to people. It's right. Well, because the research is fun. When you're when Mm -hmm. you're doing research for things that people enjoy, that's a lot easier than telling people, oh, you shouldn't do this at all. Uh, my wife and I talk a lot about you know, my practice. It is has to do with people doing these hard things to get healthy. Yes. And so it's a lot harder to convince somebody to come do this versus somebody that owns a coffee shop or a mm. chocolate shop or something where they're selling things that make you feel good and you want to do it even if it is bad for you. Yeah. Well, what about smoking then? I know people still smoke. Right. Is there any situation where is is there such thing as all natural tobacco? Is there something where people can smoke? I know that sounds so outrageous to say that. Yeah. So smoking itself, the cigarette smoke, definitely that's where all the carcinogens are. So that's a big no no, no matter right. what. A traditional right. cigarette. Yes. Okay. And nicotine itself though. Yes. It, I mean, there's a lot of interesting research for uh, biohacking and things with looking at nicotine mm-hmm. and how it does improve your brain. And it's kind of weird because smokers, in some ways, would destroy their bodies with all of the contaminants <laughs> of the of the cigarette itself. It's not funny, but yeah. But the nicotine could help 
save their brain some. I right. mean, you know, so you they have... can be more acutely aware of the damage they're doing to their bodies. Right. It seems very right. unfair. Yeah. Uh, because and it's yeah that's that's so interesting and i always i want i see some of my patients that are smokers yeah. and obviously a lot of people that come to my office if they're smokers they want to quit and i would imagine right, it's just that right. it's really hard yeah but you have some people that are really invested in their smoking oh and they take all of these other factors to the nth degree They want to be sure they're eating perfectly 100% organic and drinking the purest of pure water and no alcohol maybe. And and they'll fight me on supplements because they think maybe it's not as healthy for them. And But they're always doing those things because they want to make sure they're doing everything else 100% right so they can keep try to keep smoking. Maybe it'll justify and outweigh the bad. The bad. So it's a comp- compensatory situation. Right. Does, it feels a little compulsive, too. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's yeah. an addiction. Yeah. <laughs> so, But it's interesting, like, even the um, compulsive nature of making sure everything else is clean, I guess, would yeah. be the best way to say it versus the well, smoking. It just comes with justifying your addiction. That's all. It's so interesting. Before we move on from the seven factors that are the foundation of living a healthy lifestyle, let's pause on the weight issue Yeah, for a moment. And we're all thinking about that with the new year as well. I heard this great quote. Somebody said, you don't gain weight between Christmas and New Year's. You gain weight between New Year's and Christmas. <laughs> like flipping it on their right, head. Right. R- flipping it on its head. Like, oh, I just gained so much weight over the holidays. It's really something that has become, that's accumulated over time. Right. It's bad habits. Yeah. Accumulating over time for the most part. Mm-hmm. For the most part. Um, so, and we talked about before like privately the influence of the media and the body positivity movement and i think you have a really great view on that yeah it's the that whole body positivity issue is really interesting Mm -hmm. because there are good things about it and bad right you know you can't deny that being obese harms your health well, apparently we are denying that, Ted, so right. just to catch you up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, you can't deny that, in, you know, obesity increases your risk for heart disease, diabetes, different types of cancers. That's just science. Right. Not to mention the extra weight on your joints is going to increase your arthritis pains and make you miserable. Mm-hmm. So that side of it. It's... That's the non-biased science part. That's right. just data. Yeah. And if we talk about the data, that doesn't make us any kind of phobic or anti-anything. We're just right. talking about the data. Right. 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 And But there is there is something to people accepting who they are and being comfortable with the person inside your skin. Oh, I love that. Yes. You can be comfortable with the person inside your skin and still, because you love that person, want to change right. so that the outer person, which all the same person, is, is healthier. Right. Yeah. And, but yeah, by doing that, though, not denying that those the extra pounds could be harmful to you. But I think thinking about this a lot more, um, I think that whole body positivity and having telling people that it does not matter whatsoever, I think it comes down to a couple of kind of basic factors. Okay. For one, we have a weight loss industry that makes billions of dollars selling everything under the sun and 99% of it doesn't work. Right. Talk about secrets. And we we get so hooked into that. Right. And you have so much mis-messaging with different people on what works to lose weight, what doesn't. Oh, it's so confusing. It is. It is. So people don't know what to do and probably aren't doing the right things to lose weight. And Mm. so on that end, it's people are justified in some ways in saying, okay, for my mental well-being, 
I need to stop worrying about this. Oh, I love that. Yes, that is a good point. And I was also thinking about it just from being tired of being judged or people saying mean things. And you want that to stop. Right. The, you want the bullying to stop. And right. so if we could all just accept, right? And mm-hmm. But again, like I think you made a really great point. We are more than our bodies. Right. There's so much more to a human being. Yeah. And the outside judgment, yes. we, we don't do that nearly as much these days. And I think that that's, that's, good. that's part of the po- body positivity that that's so really good. should stick. Nobody yes. should you know say to somebody else, you're too fat. Yes. Or say something even worse. Right. Mean. Right. Yes. Right. That should stick as well as just accepting yourself for, for where you are. Right. While... Yeah. Wanting to change. Because people are the hardest. We're always the hardest on ourselves. So true. And so by, in some ways, accepting, I guess it comes down to accepting that your weight doesn't make you less of a person. It doesn't detract from you as a person. Yeah. And so that, I think, is really important Mm -hmm. because that will then also help people do what's needed to get their bodies healthier. Like you said, loving your body so that you can make that extra effort so you can be healthier. You can be healthier. Yeah, I like that. And I think there's a lot in the culture that is around appearance. And that's another piece of our appearance. Like aging is forbidden. Being overweight is forbidden. There's so many things that people feel judged for or maybe are judged for. Right. And it kind of like we just need to collectively see each other for who we really are inside. So then about weight then. So do people, when people hire you to be their naturopathic doctor, do they, they don't look at you as the, a weight loss doctor, although no. it, because it's a foundation, you're not ignoring it. No, by no you're, means. Right. So what is your like general, obviously everyone's different, but what's your general approach? How does it fit in? So it depends on the patient. Definitely. I mean, most of my patients don't come to me with their number one goal of losing weight. Oh. If even and even if that is their number one goal, mm-hmm. often they have other health issues that we need to work on too. Of course, you just said. Like right. yeah, it doesn't exist by itself. Right. So when I see patients, even if they are say even if weight is their main goal, mm-hmm. I most likely won't put them on a diet and supplement plan specifically for that, especially in the beginning. Why? Because in that first visit, I want to make sure that people are eating healthy. Yes. Not just restricting calories to lose Mm -hmm. weight, Mm -hmm. working on relearning how to eat healthy, but then also working on their energy and their stress and some of these other factors so that they're once once they're feeling better then they can work when they're ready they can work on that weight loss part and be much much more successful oh i love that it's like the reverse approach that you see right starting with the foundation because a healthy sound person that has the basics is going to be have more energy to work out Mm -hmm. have more energy to just to make the decisions right to to choose this versus that. Yeah. Like when you're exhausted and stressed, you just go for what's fast. Right. That's such a sound approach. Yeah. And so when I do have those patients that that's their number one goal, and maybe their health is fairly good, mm-hmm. I'm still going to approach it that way, but have that conversation with them and try to tease out, is this really the most important thing? And yes. if because sometimes people are really motivated and yes, we need to jump on that motivation mm. so that they can lose that weight because that is something really important. I love that. Uh, but you know, it's it's about finding where they are and making sure that we're addressing that properly. And one of the things I'm sure you address properly is the number two point is addressing chronic health issues. And we do we do acknowledge that being overweight can be in and of itself a chronic health issue, but you would perceive it, as would I, as part of of everything else that's going right. on. So addressing chronic health issues, that's a big one, because don't we spend more in this country on chronic lifestyle-related health issues? Yeah, our healthcare spending in the United States, 75% is on chronic diseases. And with that, 
if we work on all of those steps we talked on in number one, you could, those are all of these chronic diseases, whether it is diabetes or heart disease or cancers, there's a lot mm -hmm. of different links with taking care of your body, your health, that can greatly reduce those risks. So when we talk about as far as how expensive healthcare is in our country, mm -hmm. um, that's part of that's part of where that fits because mm. we could potentially cut fifty percent out of our nation's budget on healthcare if people took responsibility for their health. And by that, when you say take responsibility for their health, I just want to. I want people to hear it like I'm hearing it, yeah. meaning you have the ability to respond to this. Right. Not like you're at fault, you're to blame, you are not, it's not a defeatist statement. No. It's you have the ability. Maybe you just need the right tools, the right plan, the right program, the right um, kind of love and care from someone who's going to help you. Yeah, the right proper guidance. Yes. Loving proper guidance. I would love to. I would love to see that for all for all people who gen, genuinely want to make positive changes. Yes, that's how I look at that word responsibility, and I think that's a, a good definition for people. Right, and so when you're looking at a good professional, obviously mm -hmm. conventional medicine does very little for addressing those basic lifestyle factors. Okay, so you mean aside from medication? Correct. Okay, so you get a medication for your diabetes, you get a medication for your high blood pressure, and all that. But that's that. taking care of the symptoms. Right. We're talking so about. We're right. Talking exactly. About, we're talking about these key health factors of you know eating healthy, exercising, all of those things that your medical doctor doesn't have time, or even most of the time, the education to really fully put a plan in place for you. And understanding, though, that their perception is that they are right. because they've given you the pill for all of the things, even diabetes or um, weight loss now right. with all the, med the injections for weight loss. Oh, yeah. So they have in their minds fixed it, right? which is a different perspective. And not to say that getting your blood pressure under control with medication under doctor's supervision and taking your diabetes medicine and doing all that. Yes, that is should be done. If your doctor says to do it, do it. Right. But it should be, I think, a bridge and not a destination. Correct. So it's something that buys you some time. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> to yeah. get it together underneath all of that. So what I find fascinating mm -hmm. is with people that are starting to do Ozempic. Yes, this is a big loss. trend. Big trend. Because in my head, I look at this and... Yes, it's easy to lose weight because you don't have an appetite. Right. I'd love that. Yeah. And, but you go off of that as empic because, of course, some people are doing it just for weight loss. Somebody that's on, that has diabetes, they're probably going to be on it lifelong. And so it, this doesn't matter. But if you were type just, two diabetes, they don't right, have to two. be, though. I mean, right. type two diabetes can be reversed. I right. think we should just say this, but it, it is the perception. That because I have a disease called type 2 diabetes, I'm going to take whatever it is for the rest of my life. Right. Whereas the perception is once I lose weight, right, right. I'll be fine and my life can begin. But exactly. that's not the messaging that we give with drugs like Ozempic. No. And like you said, then they, okay, so you've lost weight and now you're going to have to eat again because right. you're going to be hungry. Right. And, and then what? Well, exactly, because because yes, you're going to be you're all of a sudden have to deal with that hunger that you've always been dealing with before, uh, and so you won't have you won't have the tools to deal with that. Yes. Plus, on the other side of that too is by doing such rapid weight loss without eating healthy and necessarily exercising, do other things, you're going to be losing muscle just as much as you are fat. Right. So your metabolism is going to be through the floor, and you are going to gain all of that weight back very quickly if you don't take care of yourself properly. And I, I've seen, I have one patient, that's what happened to her. Yeah. So when we look at this, it's it's very similar to if somebody has bariatric surgery. They mm -hmm. get their stomach stapled or a band or whatever it is. Yes, which is very dramatic. That is a great parallel because the right. stomach is supposed to be this size, and then you've made it this size. Right. 
And I think people, that's a great parallel because what you're doing with the Ozempic is you're hijacking your normal hormonal system. Right. And giving it, you're blocking its signals in essence, Mm -hmm. which can be good short term, but long term, you've made such a dramatic, it is equivalent to surgery. It's such a dramatic taking over of the body. Right. And just like we've seen, because we, we have data for... 20 plus years of people getting bariatric surgery. Has it been 20 years that it has to be in the at least? I think you're right. I, it has okay. To be um, but when you look at it, if you have only a certain portion of people that really work on that, like Al Roker, mm. when he got bariatric surgery, Great example. he was making sure he ate healthier and had a dietitian to help him eat healthier. He made sure to get mm-hmm. on the exercise kick. Mm-hmm. Because that's the you have to create those those goals and those habits while you're losing the weight. Yes. Otherwise, it's all going to come back. Right, and we're not against anything one has to do to jumpstart. But again, right. you still have to change your behavior. Right, other things have to change. Right, and so maybe even with the Ozempic, for people along with getting those habits, you, know, you can adjust the dosage. And as you adjust the dosage up in the beginning, you need to work on tapering back down Mm -hmm. on your dosage towards the end to try to help learn again what it's like to eat normally. Because you're going to have to. Yeah. And I think the same thing would be true of people that have really high blood pressure. They lose weight and then their medication needs to be adjusted. Right. Which is great. And that's a way I approach a lot of my patients Mm. that want to get off their blood pressure medication. We work on addressing the underlying factors that are causing their blood pressure to be elevated. Most, The most common things are stress, inactivity, and being overweight. Yes. It's hard on the body. It's hard on the heart and the circulatory system. Right. So if you take care of those factors, and there are other factors inside the body we can work with, different nutrients that might be deficient that will help. And I don't have to talk about changing their dosage because their medical doctor is going to have to deal with that. Yes. The dosage, you know, their their blood pressure goes down and you get to a point where you can't maintain that same dosage. You have to reduce it Correct. because you're getting dizzy and you're really fatigued. Yes. And you can show your doctor, look, I've lost 25 pounds. I'm eating healthier. I'm exercising. We, we need to reduce this. Yes, that is where I think really good communication comes into play and where and how and why you are a really good fit for a traditional, not not a separate from, but with a traditional right. a traditional system. Like someone who has a doctor, mm-hmm. is on medication. Yes, they can hire a naturopathic doctor as well. Right. And everyone should be thrilled about that yeah. because it's we all get what we want, which is a regular doctor wants someone to be healthier. The person wants to be healthier. Of course, that's what you want. So right. it is something that I want people to get in their heads that it's not an either or. Right. Right. They go together very, very well. And um, I don't know that we have a good segue for this, but point number three um, is on how to live longer and healthier is to get routine screenings and checkups. Oh, here's a good segue because the doctors, traditionally trained medical doctors do a good job right, with screenings and checkups. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, we look at that as preventive medicine. Right. And and it's kind of a misnomer. When you have Mm -hmm. in holistic medicine, we consider preventive medicine doing those seven lifestyle factors to get your health back so that you don't develop the problem. Right. That's preventing. Right. What a lot of times people are doing is early screening, early detection. Early detection. Exactly. Early detection is not the same as prevention. No, no. But it's considered preventive medicine in the conventional mindset. That's just marketing. That's just slick marketing. Well, but it's but they both have they're both very important, both sides of that. I agree that they're both important, but I think you should call it what it is. Oh, I agree. Yes. Yes. And so it is important though to get those screenings. Be- Absolutely. Yes, because yes. you can reduce your risks. Uh well, you can find it, I mean it's the early detection. So, say for instance, mm-hmm. you get uh 
if you know your blood pressure is high, you have high cholesterol, those are obviously increased risk factors for heart disease. And so mm-hmm. whether you whether you go on medication for those or if it's early, that's sometimes where I will have patients come to me because oh, I'm getting a little older and my cholesterol is going up, but I don't mm-hmm. want to take the medication. So I want to see the natural doctor, the naturopathic doctor, to see how we can do this naturally without having to get on medications because my parents, I see how they are. And once they started the cholesterol medication, five years later, they're on 10 more medications. Yeah, that's a that's a great place in the system for for you. And I think we've talked about this so many times, the difference between routine like prevention and detection. And I was trying to think of a simple way to break it down. And I think it's like brushing your teeth and flossing is prevention, but going to the dentist regularly is detection. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. That's yeah. perfect metaphor. It's simple. Because it is, you have the factors that you need to accomplish Mm -hmm. And then there is that routine screening and cleanings. And the dent, I mean, the dental industry has done such a good job at all of this. Yes. I mean, they they have learned where most people are paying out of pocket. Mm -hmm. And but they know, but you know, I need to go to the dentist every year or sometimes even every six months. I go every six months to be able to get those cleanings Mm -hmm. so that I don't get cavities and so we don't we can keep our teeth. Yes, because people see them and that's so right. painful. Right. It's such an immediate pain. Yeah. And I want to make sure that the things that I'm doing to prevent, I go in and is it working? Because right. she's measuring all the things and checking right. the teeth. Is my prevention working? At the the worst is that she would detect something early. Right. 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 And I think we can look at that like the whole body like that. Yeah. And I just and I guess, I guess with me, it's it's. I find that interesting because it it does go along a lot more with our vanity, and I think that's oh, part of what 100%. causes people to be on board on that part of their yes. health versus yes, you can see it be, and versus the internal stuff with the naturopathic medicine. Oh my god, and being I, healthy. I started to tell people um, because the, you know the alcohol consumption is up in this country, and right. I'm like, oh my god, imagine if people could see your liver. Right. Like if it, it's not there's organs that are not visible, like skin is visible. Right. So we're very concerned about acne and your yeah. teeth are visible and all these things. But the things that are really causing you even perhaps even bigger problems, no one can see. Thank goodness. Right. 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 I uh, Yeah. I mean, people will sometimes balk at my the fees for my services to get them healthy, but pay more to their beautician Oh, Once or twice a month for their hair. Absolutely. The beautician makes me feel good. And you're telling me to eat carrots. Yeah, it's a no-brainer, Ted. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. I understand. Yeah, right. But, but it's, just, it's interesting that psychology. It is psychology. And, and there is a perspective check. Because right. what, what you have to do, I have found, in order to get healthy and stay healthy is you're going to suffer a little bit. Right. Daily. <laughs> So you're going to pay the price in the suffering daily for the long-term goal of being healthier and living longer. Right. And there's there's just no way around that. Yeah. I mean, there's ways to ease the suffering, but it is not easy. Right. But to to sort of finish up this piece on early detection. Yes. And why that's important. Mm -hmm. So breast cancer is a really good example. Oh, great example. Because if you detect a breast cancer very early, you can have as much as a 99% chance of long-term survival. Wow. If you catch that cancer, breast cancer stage four very late, you're talking about less than a 20% chance of survival. Wow. That's a great point to drive the, that home. Right. Because that's a screening that is done so routinely. So people understand and know it. And just like you're flossing and brushing your teeth is something that we all understand a lot better. Which is good. Yes. Which is good. We wish we could apply that kind of understanding to just overall wellness. All right. So our number four point, our number four way to live longer and healthier is to prepare for your doctor's visits. Yeah. I like this one. 
Because I don't think people think about it. No, and it's it's really unfortunate because people really don't get the most out of their visits because they don't plan ahead. Right. Well, no one tells them to. No, there's, no. There's great I- ideas you have about before, during, and after the visit. Right. It kind of reconceptualizes the doctor's visit, yeah. which I love. That whole thing needed a makeover. Yeah, definitely. A rebrand, right. as and the kids say. When you consider that, con- especially conventional doctors, mm-hmm. they don't have the time to really spend full time with you. You need to... You need to be prepared. You need, you need to, to understand that and exactly. maximize it. Right, right. Mm-hmm. So that pre-planning step, you know, we have to first write down changes in our health, changes in our medications, any testing we may have done from another doctor. Yeah, because they might not know. You no. assume they know. They right. don't know. Right. Typically, mm-hmm. they don't. Mm-hmm. Even if it's in the same uh, medical system, they're still using the same electronic medical records. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're busy and they didn't get a chance to look at that. So you need to be good and be your own advocate so that you can take care of all this. And in fact, we were, uh, I had an appointment with my son's neurologist, a new neurologist. Yeah. And we've talked personally, we haven't talked on the the podcast about how my my children have autism. Um, But I found that I didn't do this properly. You, you weren't prepared for the visit. I wasn't prepared for the visit. Very interesting. Because my son's 17, he's nonverbal, so it's hard to to gauge a lot what's going on inside as okay. much. But things we've we've gotten so used to his symptoms that you just internalize it. You don't even really think about it to explain it to somebody new. So I I was prepared in my head about the different things I wanted to accomplish, and but to give this new neurologist a true picture of what was going on with my son's symptoms, I had to work really hard. That is so interesting. Because it's just my day-to-day, it's our day-to-day with his symptoms, and you don't think about it. Well, like somebody with depression, anxiety, hypertension, it is their day-to-day. Right. So you have to train yourself to observe yourself. Yeah. You can observe your your child and maybe take notes. Mm-hmm. Is that how you would? And then somebody, I try to tell people to try to take notes with themselves and just like yeah. keep a running tally of how you feel and what's happening. Right. So do you do that at home with your son? Not or as much no, as because, I should. Because it's like you said, it's just your life. Right. No one's taking notes on their life. Right. And and after that visit, I we had already had this whole episode planned, but that made me take a, just another step back and look at how important it is just for symptom tracking. Yes. And I'm working at bringing a new system into my office to help people to better track their symptoms so that we can see progress through our therapies, but be able to have something that they can have on their phone or on their computer so that they can take a daily or a weekly assessment. assessment. I was just going to say, isn't there an app for that? My there goodness, is. there's yeah. an app for everything. Right. No, that's great. Yeah. Like not everybody loves to do what I do, which is take a pen and paper and write stuff down and carry yeah. around notes. Everything's on your phone. Right. This should be on your phone. Yes. We track everything, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. So this is good. You're going to implement that in your practice. And I would think it'd be very rewarding, too. We think of perhaps too often the downside. Like, oh, you come back to the doctor after so much time. Say you're starting on a new antidepressant. What's changed? Nothing. Okay, here, we're going to change the dose. What's changed? Nothing. Here, we're going to add. But did you really pay attention to yourself over these three months? Right. Because you're you. You don't. If you would pay attention, you you would notice things like, I'm sleeping better. I'm right. going out more. Right. It seems healthy change feels very natural, right. and it should. Yeah. So as such, it doesn't seem notable. But how rewarding to see the benefits of whatever it is you're doing. Yeah, and that's why when I'm in with my patients, of course, I spend a lot of time with my patients, mm-hmm. and I write down all of those symptoms so that I can go back at the next visit and talk about it too. And don't people say, "Oh no, that's I don't have that anymore," but they don't realize that they right. would have never brought it up had you not. It's, it's it is funny because I've had several patients over the years who I don't we don't even get into the 
into the door of my office and close the door before they're saying, well, nothing worked. I'm exactly the same. Yes. And I know better. I, mm -hmm. I, okay. I'm sorry to hear that. Right. Because I'm, I'm not going to judge them on that. Maybe, right. they, maybe they aren't. And there's, there's there. always times where, yeah, that's Nothing's the case. Working. Mm -hmm. But then I go through and talk about everything that we talked about at the last visit, and they're did, like, "Who is that person? <laughs> right, right. It's not me. <laughs> right. Um, you know, how how is your energy? Is your energy still low? Well, no." Um, you know, how about that knee pain that was bothering? No. Did I tell you that? No, no. These are my symptoms. Yes. And I look at the chart and I'm like, but you didn't tell me about any of these. All these other symptoms that we covered in your first visit, they're better now and you forgot about them. Yes. Because that's the way our bodies work. We, we are under so much stress. We have so many different things to do in our lives that our bodies once once something's gone, totally gone. Out of we, mind. Exactly. We forget about it. We're on to the next thing. Exactly. The next problem. <laughs> right. No, that's great. So that is such a great, so many good reasons for being prepared and tracking your symptoms. Right. Love that. So that's probably good for preparing for a doctor's visit, I think. Well. Or do you have one more thing? I have one more thing, and that is making sure that you have somebody come with you. Oh, that's such a great point. Because yes. in, in it depends. It depends on your state of health too. I mean, if somebody's fairly young and fairly healthy, they don't have a lot going on. You probably don't need your spouse mm -hmm. or friend or sibling or whatever to come in. But when you start having more health issues, is where it's really important because you you can have somebody that's taking notes, right, and can remember what the doctor said when they shocked you when they told you you have high cholesterol or you have high blood pressure or whatever it might be, you have a third party that can, you know, pay attention to that. Yes, because I think people don't realize it's just human nature sometimes to go into that kind of shock state and you literally stop listening. Right. It's biology, right. not yeah. psychology. So it's great to have that kind of support and that second set of eyes and ears to be there for you plus, to catch those things. Right. And plus, if you're writing all of your symptoms down and talk about the other doctor's visits and mm -hmm. other testing and whatnot, if you forget to tell the doctor, well, they can interject. Or if, if you are ashamed to talk about something and the other person really cares about you, they should bring that up so that the, you can have an honest conversation with the doctor and bring that up so that we Which can treat is it. so important because you're right. I know somebody who wanted to omit a very important thing in the visit mm. and um, someone had to go with them, someone who loves them very much and to, to talk about the thing that they, the doctor can't help you if you don't say what's really going on. Right. And it, it is hard. I'm not saying it's not hard and I'm not sympathetic, but I think in the long term, it's better to suffer a little bit and say what you don't want to say. Right. So let's go to during that doctor's yes. visit. Okay. You you were well prepared and now you're in the visit with your doctor. Right. And so number one, you need to be open and honest with the doctor like we were just, just talking saying. about because they can't help you if you don't tell them what's wrong. Right. So you have your, then you're like, oh, I don't want to tell them that. Right. A lot of times people omit information for very interesting reasons. Like right. I used to have patients that would tell me things. I'm like, we have to tell your doctor. I can't. They'll judge me. They'll be mad their medicine isn't working. Right. They'll be mad the medicine isn't working. Or like be people... mad that I'm not taking the medication like I'm supposed to. Yes. And so my then cholesterol's you're... not going down. So they're increasing the dosage, but it's because you're not taking the medication in and the you first did... place. Yes. And you didn't tell them. Right. Which I think goes to how valuable that relationship is. Yes. So we innately know that this is valuable, but a truly powerful relationship, a mutually beneficial relationship in involves honesty. Right. And this is no exception. No, definitely not. Okay. Be honest. Say what's really going on. And the second tip is to make sure that all of your questions get answered. All too often, we have, you know, we can put those questions down. And, and we the doctor, know we want an answer. Right. But we get there and then we don't ask. Right. Because the doctor's rushing through things mm -hmm. and you just let him. Or the perception is they're rushing. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. But your this is your health. 
you need to make sure that you get your questions answered. Right. Or else you can't do what the doctor asks you to do and be a good patient. Great point. And Ask along those with those questions, get those answers. Right. And along with that, asking for clarification for things you don't understand. That's a hard thing for people to do in general. I it think. is. It is. Uh, it's so funny how we get scared of looking stupid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we all do it. And, you know, you, the doctor says something. I Well, I don't understand that term. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to move on to the next thing. Right. So I don't have to feel embarrassed. Right. Right. And I have a friend from medical school and he was not willing to, he didn't care. He was getting his medical education. If he didn't understand something, he's going to ask it. And oh, I love that. most of the time, the rest of us didn't get it either, but we were ashamed to ask. Mm. And my good buddy, Frank, he just say it like it is. He's from Philly and he's not afraid of that. He, yeah, you know, he's just going to make sure that he gets his questions answered and understand what's going on because that especially, I mean, medical school, learning this to help others isn't any different than you understanding it for your own health during a doctor's visit. True. So that a guy like that would probably make a good patient, but also a good doctor too. Right. Oh, yeah. Because he would allow space for that, for those questions. Right. And I think... Most doctors are kind and considerate. If somebody said to them, I don't understand what you just said, they wouldn't say, well, too bad. (laughs) I'm not repeating myself. And if they they do, then that's not your doctor anymore. That's probably not a good person (laughs) for you. Correct. Correct. Right. But give them the benefit of the doubt. Of course. Of course. Because 99.9% of the time, they're going to be happy you ask that question and ask for clarification. Yes. Something bad could have happened because you misunderstood something. Yeah. Yeah. And it may have been their fault for not explaining it properly, or they may have misexplained something. Right. And you ask for the clarification, they pull back and realize, oh, I need to explain this this way Mm -hmm. so that my patient can understand. I'm talking in medical jargon that they don't understand. And if they don't understand that, then they're not going to know why I want them to go for this MRI or other testing or see a specialist or whatever it might be. Yes. It's a give and a take, a send and receive. Right, right. Send, receive, send, receive. Yes. And then your last point on this during the visit asking for help implementing your plan if needed. Give a good example for that. So so if 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 somebody is you your doctor prescribes a medication mm-hmm. and well you don't know when am I supposed to take that medication? Is it supposed to be at bedtime? Is it supposed to be in the morning? Is it supposed to be with food or away from food? Mm-hmm. Uh, also say you're not you haven't been in the medical system before this is your first big health issue oh wow and you, you may need a lot of support especially right. with a big diagnosis right and so you don't you don't know exactly how to change your diet down, ch- that's no. what i always think because what what we hear like here's my first blood pressure medicine what did your doctor tell you oh i got to eat healthy right they don't know what that means right but also how often does a doctor just write down the script, I want you to go for these labs, but never tells you, Why? okay, the 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 where you get your blood draw is two doors down from here, and you need to make sure that you're doing it fasting or oh, whatever yeah, it might be. Oh, good point. Little, the little details. The little details, and especially okay. somebody that's not been in the system before. They don't know these they things. They really don't know those things. It's true. And... It could. That is a great point. We who are in the system, it's just like breathing to us. Right. Someone who's never been in the system, it's like a strange world with a different language and a different mm-hmm. set of rules and things you don't even know you don't know. Right. So I keep talking about cholesterol, but yeah. say they your doctor sends you for some routine screening. You haven't really done this before. You don't realize that I'm supposed to do it fasting overnight. So you go to the lab, get your blood drawn. You're, you just had a, a Big Mac and fries and whatever else. God forbid. <laughs> exactly. And then your doctor sees your cholesterol sky high because of that. 
puts you on medication and maybe you didn't really have cholesterol issues, it was because you did it non-fasting. And it was in your bloodstream. Right. And that's such a great point. I mean, I hear my, I hear you saying this. And I'm like, well, everybody knows that. No, they don't. No. No, they don't. We make a lot of assumptions as healthcare providers about what people understand and what they right. don't understand. Right. All right. So then we that's being prepared for the doctor's visit. A very important factor. And then our next topic under that is what to do if your doctor suspects a major health issue. So you're in the visit. Yes. You've done your pre-planning. You've prepared for this visit. And your doctor suspects a major health issue. What then? Well, first thing is to not get ahead of yourself and get too scared. Because oftentimes we have routine screenings where a cancer or something might be suspected. Mm -hmm. But there could be other reasons for that lab being out of range or a lump or whatnot. So I always tell patients to don't get scared yet about that. Make sure that you wait until they tell you that something's wrong. Obviously, human nature, we're going to be worried. Yeah, we suspect the worst. It is part of human nature. Right. Like We're always worried that something has gone terribly right. wrong. But if we can... Self-preservation, that's a normal thing. Right. Yes. Right. But if you can have that proper perspective and know that a lot of the time it's going to be a false positive, mm -hmm. this isn't going to be me going through this horrible cancer treatment or whatnot, mm -hmm. wait until they tell you that there's something to be worried about. Yeah. Trust the process. Right. Trust You've the come process, this far, says, Come this far. Trust it. Okay. So what do you have any other tips for like if something is suspected? Oh, what about getting a second opinion? Yes. So getting second opinions are very important. Mm -hmm. If you, for all types of reasons, if it's something big, you definitely want to get a second opinion to make sure that the treatment program is going to be right for you. Because there could be other options. Right, right. I mean, a lot of medicine is pretty, like, cookie cutter. Well, I'm looking for a more scientific word for that. But there may be a different perspective or a different right. option. Right, and we're talking about for big things. They, absolutely. This is a big, major health issue right. suspected here. Yeah. Right, Do I need to... What is what is what is your protocol for my cancer treatment or sure. uh, my heart disease or whatnot? And so you might get a different perspective and might find that it's something that's going to be better for you. And I think that's really scary for people. I'm just realizing something. So, so you get a diagnosis that's very big and scary. Sometimes I feel like the inclination is, okay, then just take care of it. You just take care of it. And getting a second opinion may seem even scarier. Right. Because now I may have to decide between two things. Right. Now I have to make this big decision. But, but also— you, You're always going to be part of this decision. Right. Always. Right. And the other big fear is I am, I am questioning my doctor's authority. Yes, and people may not be comfortable with that or right. may feel that it's going to threaten the relationship. Right. But I think any healthy doctor, mm -hmm. a good doctor, would welcome it. Would they not? They should. They yeah. should. Because even if you are an egotistical doctor that believe this is 100% right, mm -hmm. well, then to get my patient on board, if they need to go see another doctor to tell them the same thing yes, so that we can do what we need to do, oh, then that's okay. Great point. It's worth it to just to get the buy-in in, in some cases. Right, right. In some cases. Right. And uh, so, yeah, that's important. And then also with like the referrals, getting a, okay. you know, your doctor sends you to get a referral uh, for because for say they want to send your your primary care doctor wants to send you to the oncologist or some other oh, I see okay uh, okay a specialist early, a specialist you know and I've seen several patients that they get scared they don't want to go to say the rheumatologist mm. because well if I get diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis they're going to put me on a lot of nasty drugs right but I always push my patients to actually go to that visit because the rheumatologist is going to be the important person 
to go through all of the proper labs to get the best diagnosis. Yeah. And just because even if you are diagnosed with that rheumatoid arthritis, it doesn't mean you have to take their medications necessarily. True. So it's, that's so you still have power is what you you're still saying. have power. And I've had to talk to many patients about this. Let's go get the testing. We'll see what's going on. This will give us better perspective on what needs to, we, what, what needs to happen. What can be done. So right. it, more information is better. Exactly. Always. Love that. All right. What about after the doctor's visit? So we have a couple tips for how to process everything after the doctor's visit. Mm -hmm. So first, you're you might have more questions. It, you know, some of your routine visits, you might not have a lot of questions, but sometimes, especially if the doctor suspects something big, mm -hmm. you might have a lot more questions that didn't get answered. And after you leave the office and sit and think about it, oh, I have these other questions. That would happen. Well, right. Well, don't wait to get those questions answered until the next time you see the doctor. Right. Give a call to the office and find out those questions now, because often that's going to be part of that decision-making process of everything else that they recommended to happen from that visit. Great point. And with that, you need to complete any testing that happened that they were mm -hmm. that they recommended, uh, or if it is a referral to a specialist or whatever, that you make sure to accomplish all that. Great and point. then the last tip is to put together a plan to implement everything that's going on. So you you. And if you need help with that plan, you could follow up. But then right. you're taking these steps to like think for, with your right. future. Like, how am I going to do? It might seem like a very practical thing, and you'll just figure it out as you go. Well, but but you might not because you could miss some things, and then oh, it's suddenly time for the next visit, and you realize oh, I didn't do these things because right. I didn't schedule them. Something so right. simple, exactly. right? Exactly, exactly. So just yes. being aware, and after that visit, as you're thinking about things, do I have questions? what tests, what specialists, anything else that the doctor wants, and then sit there and figure out, well, how do I fit all this into my schedule and make those, uh, Very make practical. those schedule those appointments so that we can get all of that done. Yes. And if you have trouble with that, then call back to the doctor's office and for them to help you make that happen. Right. Very good. And then we've included a PDF copy of this checklist in the podcast description for you to download. Because there was a lot of stuff there. Right. And we have it all in writing. Very good. I, I like that we did that. And then um, let's move on to another big secret to living longer and being healthy as you live longer is to address mental health issues. And I have a statistic here. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has increased mental health care needs while simultaneously restricting access with unknown long-term consequences. From August 20th to February 21st, oh, from August 2020 to February 2021, the CDC described an increase in the proportion of adults reporting recent symptoms of anxiety or depression from about 36% to about 41%, with the fraction reporting unmet mental health care needs increasing from about 9% to almost 12%. And among kids and adolescents, the proportion of mental health-related emergency department visits for those aged 5 to 11 and 12 to 17 has increased from 24 and 31 percent, respectively, compared to before the pandemic. So all of that data for our data-loving people in our audience is to say that this should be on, it is on the forefront, actually. Right. Well, and that was obviously, as we were in the middle of that whole pandemic, there was a lot going on. And of course, everybody's mental health was challenged. Right. But, but we weren't talking about it. No, we then. weren't. We and, weren't. And I, th I think we're still not. No, no. Not nearly enough. Nobody was talking about how suicides were skyrocketing during the pandemic and right. all of you know people were drinking a lot more because that was their crutch to be able to deal with their anxiety and depression mm -hmm. from uh from how scary the pandemic was right. 
and feeling isolated and lonely. Right. I think isolation, loneliness, we are creatures that need each other. Mm -hmm. And we, um, we, I, I don't think we appreciate how much we rely on each other and how hard isolation is on human beings. Right. And I think there was an element of grief. There was a lot of loss during the pandemic that we weren't talking about the grief and what everyone right. was experiencing collectively and individually right. at varying degrees. Or even, you know, the the most acute was not being able to attend a funeral of a loved family member. That's a great example because that's when you really, when you have that acute grief of losing someone you loved and you don't have that support. I think that that incident of loneliness during that time, I think we hold that in our hearts. Mm -hmm. And I think probably many of us still are. Right, right. And so luckily we're through the pandemic, but a, right. that brings us, for one, some of that has not been addressed. A lot of that probably hasn't been addressed in people's lives. Right. But also just the everyday, day-to-day -day mental health issues that people face that yes. we don't really cover well. And there's definitely been much better push to, uh, in the media, the the PSAs and things to make it people understand that it's okay to talk about your depression, that it doesn't make yeah. you weak. Correct. That, and there's been, there's been a push for that. It's still, but people still aren't addressing and really taking these things on well enough often. I think so too. And I think the reason is it's hard to be vulnerable in that way. Mm -hmm. um, we have a culture that really kind of, yes, we do rely on each other psychologically and we are creatures that need other creatures and other humans, but there's still this thing about an American being very independent and up by your bootstraps and solving all your problems, that independent spirit, which is great. But I think here's where it, it kind of works against us. Yeah. In a way. And with that, too, is that people don't necessarily understand all of the options they have. Oh. Because— Well, I think that's a great point, because a lot of times, a lot of the messaging, because we do allow prescription drug advertising direct to consumer in this country, we are kind of programmed to believe that there's a pill for every problem, right. including a mental health issue. And not to say that they can't help, but again, I would say by and large, they should be the bridge, not the destination. Right. Because I just I just can't accept that there's a pill for grief. I, I just can't no. accept it. No. And but that's the thing is that in our society, there's two options. It's either medication or counseling. Oh, and there can be so many things. Right, right. So with yeah. natural medicine, there are so many ways for us yeah. to help this and address this with different supplements that maybe there's nutrient deficiencies. You have a B12 deficiencies or or different amino acid deficiencies that are contributing. Uh, also, lack of exercise. Exercise mm -hmm. is so important for our mental well-being. And if you're not getting that exercise, you're going to be more stressed. You're going to be more anxious or depressed. Yes, we were just talking about that in CrossFit today. I mostly do CrossFit for my mental strength mm -hmm. because it's so impossible for me to do that I kind of build that resilience, that mental muscle that I can do hard things. Right. And... um feelings of grief and isolation and anxiety and depression, getting through those is a hard thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that I don't get help or that people shouldn't get help, but I, yeah, I get that exercise has other benefits, but for me, it's always been about my mental health. Right. Yeah. And like we were talking about earlier with the lifestyle factors, mm -hmm. when I'm working in my practice with patients, Mental health is definitely something that we have to pay attention to early on in that doctor-patient relationship. Be like I, had, we talked about early in the episode, I work on eating good. I make sure that mm -hmm. people's energy is good, and I work on right. the mental part of it too. Because that will, if you have a better mental outlook you'll be able to follow the plans better and get better results. Of course. It's all connected. Right. The mind and the body are 
all have always been hanging out together. They will always <laughs> hang out together. Are you sure? Yes, I, I, I'm a hundred percent on but this. The, but the psychiatrist, I know, and the neurologist, I know, we need the all gastroenterologist. These. They all would have a different thing to it's say about so that. It's so true. But didn't we? Haven't we learned recently about how much the gut health influences our brains? Oh yeah. Like I've always known this. Because I hung around with people like you even 30 <laughs> years ago, but you've known this. Like a healthy gut is so important to your mental health. Right, right. For lots of different reasons. Right. And you always would be addressing that gut. Right. Well, because, yeah, if we're not getting the right nutrients, then we're, we're going to have nutrient deficiencies that could affect that mental health. We I don't think oh, people know that. Right. We could be having food sensitivities or allergies that are affecting that mental health. If you're not eating properly, you could be having low blood sugar spells that are causing changes in that mental health. So there's a lot of just basic stuff. It doesn't have to be this woo-woo, your gut controls your mind. And you know, I mean, it's definitely a lot. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I like that. No, well, I agree. It, it influences. Agree. It influences. Exactly. Yes. Oh, it's a great point, though. Like what you just said, it's like... That's now the messaging, and I think with that messaging comes a lot of a lot of things that are very fancy and very complex, right. and magic pills or magic herbs or whatever. And that's not not always you... not always where you need to be. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it! Right. Um, and you're a believer in counseling and talking to people, right. yeah. And you would you would suggest that for people, if of they, course, yeah. of course. Yeah. And I wasn't discounting that. Oh but no, I no, wasn't saying no. that you that you were, but I think it's something that maybe we don't think of a naturopathic doctor would suggest a counselor for somebody. I mean, as part of my naturopathic training. We were trained in counseling. See, I don't think people know that. Of course not. Yeah. But I mean, it doesn't mean that I'm going to take the role of somebody's counselor. But at the most basic level, you have to have that understanding of people to be able to help them make their changes in their health. Love that. And if you don't have an understanding of all of the different medical specialties, well, then you don't know when to refer somebody to those different specialists to get the proper help. Good point. Good point. Um, and I like this, what you what you also have here is learn as much as you can about your condition. Right. And I, I think of the time after my car accident where I was diagnosed with PTSD, which I just thought was an outrage. How dare you give me a diagnosis? And I called a really good friend who is a psychiatrist. He's like, you need to learn as much as you can about this. Right. And I'm like, that's, it seemed like strange advice at the time. He said, no, you're a thinking person. You like to figure things out. And the surprises that I got from just looking at what it, what it means to have that from the studies they've done on our combat veterans and what medications most of them don't work. Well, I right. didn't know that because when I was dispensing these medications to people who had it, I just assumed that there was a lot of evidence to suggest mm -hmm. that they work and there's really not. Right. It definitely took the edge off. But the way the things that were presented to me that are were so exciting for me, like I was excited, like, oh, I don't want to take this or that medication, but equine assisted therapy has shown to be effective. Biofeedback is shown to be yeah. effective. I'm like, well, that is right up my alley. So suddenly, instead of being, oh, I hate this diagnosis, forget it, I'm done with this, I'll just live like this, right. which wasn't a good way to live, no. but I was willing to do it just because I didn't want to face it. Then I became excited and was more I guess more willing to be an active participant in my own well right, being. Right, right. You were up for the challenge. I was up for it because it was something exciting that yeah. I learned just from reading about it. Yeah. Which I wasn't going to do mm -hmm. because it's me. I'll right. learn about your disease, dear patient. <laughs> I know about your disease and your PTSD and your this and your that. But when it's me, I'm like, I didn't want to. Right. And if somebody hasn't already watched all of our previous episodes, when we're talking about getting getting learning as much as you can you need to watch our episode on ditch your doctor how social media has become the new medical expert and right. understand the give and take of that information exactly yes and i don't believe at that time i don't think i don't think social media was as big it was 12 years ago yeah but that's not where i went for my information right, right. but yeah, yeah but still like i think that's such a great point because when you when people say, "Oh, I researched it, I studied about it," where where are you going to get right. the information? Right. right. Um, 
Oh, this I think was a really good point about one of my favorite books on this topic is written by Johan Hari called Lost Connections, Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression. And he has some very unexpected solutions, which I think directly relate to the unprecedented times. And he does acknowledge that it could be a chemical imbalance. So if that's something that you know, your doctor wants to address that with you, then you should definitely follow that. But a doctor had read the book and commented, I think it was on a review, saying that that was one of the connections that were lost, Mm -hmm. the doctor-patient relationship connection, because either people couldn't go to their doctor, they were afraid to go out, or just the things that were starting to happen after where we didn't trust science as much and we didn't right. trust in general. And there's an erosion of trust across the board. And I just thought how interesting and kind of ironic that is, that right. the pandemic has caused a disconnect from our own healthcare providers. Right. Well, I, I, I saw it all over the place. I mean, I have a, my wife's stepfather has heart disease mm-hmm. and- his cardiologist for for the whole pandemic would only see him virtually. Oh wow! Yes, so, virtual visits. Of course, you don't right. feel that well, human connection as much. But you can't test. Oh, you can't God. take your blood pressure. You can't do anything. Yeah, you, know, you can't do any physical exams to see what's going on. So they would just talk about, I guess, symptoms or medication dosages. I'm sure. Yeah, just yeah. the basics there. Yeah, but. For a lot of people, that could be really dangerous. Wow, I forgot about that, that a lot of the doctors were doing virtual visits. And they probably, that was a not a new technology, but certainly new way to interface with the patient. Right. I'm not sure right. that they were 100% engaged the patient might not have been engaged because we're using the used to looking at a screen very passively right and now we're expected to interact with one of the most important people in our lives yeah. via a screen not that it can't be done effectively but at the beginning i think it was definitely right. a, a right. lot harder yeah you'd always wow. I, I remember seeing something online where uh somebody was talking about boy this tv show is really boring and the other people on the conference call were like joan Pay attention. This is a this is a work meeting. <laughs> right. It's not a TV show. But it's again, I think it goes to human psychology, how we become very passive in front of a screen. Right. Right. We're just on receive or we're totally <laughs> zoned out. Oh my gosh, that's a great point. All right. What else do we have under mental health? Oh, I think it's I think again, hearkening back to the unprecedented times, being sick is very isolating. Right. And and it's scary. And you feel like you're the only one and you're alone and you're suffering. And that's why a lot of times chronic illness and depression, anxiety, they hang around together, don't they? They definitely do. Yeah. So it's important to address that aspect of that. And even like um, it's isolating even within your own family. I don't think you necessarily need a counselor, or if you have a counselor or a therapist like that, that doesn't mean you shouldn't talk with your loved ones about what's what's going on with you. Of course. Of course. You can't hide it from your You really can't hide it, but I think people think that they can. Well, I... Like, I thought I could hide the PTSD. I'm I'm not leaving my house. No one will notice. (laughs) And I didn't didn't mean that in a... That it's impossible to do it. I mean, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. But I... But, right. I know what you meant, but I think... I think... I mean, I thought I could like nobody needs to know how hard this is for me right i can fake it yeah and i think people want to help i have not lost hope in humanity (laughs) good (laughs) we we want to help each other um what else did we have to say about mental health issues but yeah just about i mean that it is so isolating um and with any health any chronic health issue, mental, physical, mental, mental, physical is going to bring in an aspect of isolation. Okay. So, because if you say you have chronic osteoarthritis mm-hmm. and you can't move well, well, you're not going to be able to get out and see your friends as well. Or mm-hmm. you, know, uh, you you won't be doing the things that you love with other people, potentially. Right, right. And that's that, hard. 
and, and that comes down to my talk about always trying to to keep your health as best as you can because mm. uh, then you can become an active participant. Right, right. Because if we're not being active in our health and we let our health drop off, we all too often think that if if I'm smoking or doing these other dangerous activities that, well, it's just going to shorten my life. And I'm like, I've, I, I would rather live on the edge and have this excitement and go out in a blaze of glory <laughs> than to have to be good. But yes, unfortunately, it doesn't not, work that way. Boy, that's watching too many movies. Very few people <laughs> right. go out like that. Yeah. It is long, slow, and painful and exactly. isolating, right. which right. I don't think people are thinking right. about. Yeah. Yeah, and that's we talked about that in one of our other episodes with taking you know taking control of your health so that you can because paying for different therapies natural therapies to can, prevent to prevent and or reduce your <laughs> disease state yeah um, it's a an investment in your future because you don't want to have your later life where you're stuck in the house and can't do anything or in chronic pain where you can't enjoy your life, it's worthwhile when you're young to take control over it so that you don't get to that place. Right. And we, we've always done that. I've always taught my kids that. And I love hearing you say it because back then it did, it seemed like, well, this could fail, but we spent our money on preventative medicine. We were right. doing things that now it seems pretty mainstream, like the people that I was hiring to help with certain things. And I remember visiting um, my homeopath at the time and his family and she had this big bowl of beautiful produce on her counter. And she just kind of pointed and said, this is where our money goes. Meaning, and she, it, in that sentence, she was saying really so much. Right. It was organic. It was locally grown. She, what she's saying is this is where... We spend our focus and our energy and really good, high-quality food that I cook here in the home so that my kids are going to grow up to have a long, healthy life. Right, right. I just love that. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, people look at eating healthy as too expensive. Or I, th I think more often, it's it can be used as an excuse because we still want to eat the same processed food. So we're just... Pay, we're paying three times as much for organic Oreos and gluten-free Oreos or <laughs> <laughs> all natural Oreos. Exactly. Best invention ever. <laughs> now I'm healthy. Right, right. And, I spent twelve dollars for this pack. Right. And yeah, you know, you're you you can't have gluten or wheat. And so you have to spend, you know, five, six, seven, eight dollars on a loaf of bread. Well, Maybe, yeah, you have to have some of that for variety in your life, right. but maybe you shouldn't be having two pieces of toast with breakfast, a sandwich or two at lunch, right. and then some buttered bread at dinner where you're eating almost a loaf of bread at, you know, six, six seven, eight dollars. Yeah. It's, it's about those priorities. Yes. And really having a, a, an understanding of what what is the baseline for getting healthy. Mm -hmm. And we do get off on those tangents. Right. Right. I, I love to tell people that... What's more expensive, a pound of bananas or a pound of M&Ms? What is more expensive? Well, a pound of bananas is usually like 50 cents or less. I buy a lot of bananas. I don't buy any <laughs> M&Ms, so I don't right, know. Right. Yeah. Well, you're going to spend you know, several several. Oh, dollars. That. I mean, that's not something I buy either. No, but that's but... such a great example. Yeah. Because really, though, Ted, <laughs> if I were to find myself... In the candy aisle, God forbid. Here I am in the candy aisle. If I am indeed purchasing a pound of M&Ms, I'm not, I'm thinking about the joy and right, the fun. Right. I'm not buying M&Ms, Ted, at that point. I'm buying joy and fun. That's what I'm buying. Right. But that's where we need to, again, change that kind of right. narrative. Yeah. If you're eating the edge of the grocery store, you're yes. eating, getting your produce and your meats and things on that end yeah, and not a bunch of processed right, food. Right. Don't wander in there. No. If you're in there, they got you. The natural gonna... versions of those are always going to be, yes, that's where you would spend all of that extra money. If right. you're eating your, your good, healthy, basic foods, it's not going to be 
that much more expensive and might might even save you money if you're really doing a diligent job with it. Right. And but that's a whole lifestyle change too. Right. Because then right. you're cooking and you're preparing and it's 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 a whole thing. Yeah. And then maybe do we have anything else to say about mental health? No, I think we've now we're in the grocery store with M and M's. Right. Which is where I which I love that. Now I'm now I need M and M's. Um our last point, which is a good segue, is that you do have to participate. Our last point, number six, is it really cannot happen without you. No. You have to participate. You, yes, absolutely hire the best that you can and get advice and all of those things, but you really do have to be an active participant. Even if you don't have all the answers about yourself or you don't right. know or you're scared or whatever, you have to participate. And I think that that's a big area where we've gotten on track off track with our society with health because hmm. our parents and especially starting with our grandparents respected their doctor and that was all you needed to do was listen to your doctor and follow their advice all right and you know, you didn't question the advice and you didn't need to do anything different there was going to be a drug to solve that problem so True. you know it's easier this way so i'm just going to do this mm -hmm. and people for the most part, lost that their ability to be an active participant, participant in their health. And, but, and, and look at the data. Right. That doesn't work. No. We're not saying abandon anything, but ins reinsert yourself right. into your own wellness journey. Right. Yeah. yeah. Don't turn it over to anybody. No, no, because you are going to, you are going to be able to be the person you, you have for one, it's going to affect you the most. If yeah. you don't do what you're supposed to do, you're the only one that's going to affect negatively. It's not going to affect your doctor or anyone else. Or anyone else. Right. It's it's you. So you deserve to get the best for yourself and be an active participant so that you can make that happen. Absolutely. I think that's a great place to end this. Definitely. Yes. So thank you, Ted, for your great insights. Thank you all for listening, watching. See you next time. Thank you for joining us for this podcast. Mary and Dr. Ted want to remind you to use the internet wisely and to always be sure to consult with your medical provider with any questions or concerns that you may have as you work towards your wellness goals. We look forward to sharing more content with you soon. Thanks for listening.